we're talking about some very serious weapons and I'm going to promote the idea of having these weapons and then try to demote the idea of not having these weapons. So it's going to be a conflict for me as well. When they first reported that on 27th of July, a certain kind of a hypersonic vehicle, possibly a weapon, had for the first time ever completed an orbit around the Earth before coming down to impact a pre-designated location on the, on, uh, on the ground. This was the first of its kind test and it was conducted by China of successfully entering a hypersonic orbiter in space and then re-entering the Earth's atmosphere to impact a ground location. Although China clearly denies having carried out a weapon test, instead it states that a reuse reusable spacecraft was experimentally tested for orbital flight. Hence the exact identity of the hypersonic flight platform is still contentious. Nevertheless, one thing is for sure. The technology bar for hypersonic technologies has been raised to a very new high for all major powers in the world. Now, analyzing the situation and the extreme level of technological advancement that have gone into this field, uh, General Hyden, the Deputy Chairman of Joint Staff of US Military, had stated that these weapons would possibly become one day the weapons of first use for all militaries. Uh, behold of the, of the technologies in any major conflict. And that this development had come possibly over a certain time period in which China had invested and conducted hundreds of hypersonic tests while in the same period the adversary US had only carried out nine of them. This is the situation that has started to build up. This new and emerging trend has today set the stage for a new generation of ballistic weapons now almost ready to challenge the strategic balance of the global and regional theaters. Thus the topic, major power competition in hypersonic weapons and their impact on regional stability. I shall be addressing some questions uh, possible in this domain. Why these weapons exist? How, they, how are we defining these weapons? Why do we really, what kind of technology goes into it? How do these weapons work? A concept of operations for these weapons, some balancing act and stability, regional and global stability issues in a hypersonic weapons hangover. Right, so the first question is, why do we really need the ballistic, the next generation of ballistic weapons? As one can see, that over a 70 year period, the world has seen the strategic weapons stockpile of major powers steadily reduced. In many ways, it has stabilized to a new equilibrium point with US and Russia possessing 90% of the world's nuclear warheads. This equilibrium in a rapidly changing world, world dynamics was bound to get disturbed, especially once counter-ballistic weapons started to emerge on the horizon. So there is something which is now rendering the ballistic weapons less effective. This really complex mission picture, I'm going to explain this, the mission picture to the right shows that today any nation which has any reasonable amount of space presence and terrestrial assets can detect a ballistic missile launch. And by the time, at point number two, the first burnout takes place, the sensors and the space sensors are already queued in. Once into the orbit, high power tracking sensors, space or ground based, can accurately locate, have to basically locate just three locations on the trajectory to complete the mission construct of the missile. The data can now be collected and passed on to a kill vehicle which can intercept this ballistic missile, possibly at its apogee and thus neutralize the threat. This is predictability which is killing these weapons. The predictability is leading to trackability and interceptability and this is the reason why the world is now looking for a new generation of ballistic weapons. We look at some of the technologies which are now making headways into the, the in fact, before the, with that, let's look at some of the features that these new generation weapons would likely to have. I've highlighted specifically interoperability, lower detection, higher survivability, and an enhanced maneuverability as the key to the next generation of ballistic weapons. The list is pretty long, right? as you can see here. 
But these four are going to be the game changer characteristics for the next generation ballistic weapons. We can look at, take a look at some of the technologies that are now making headlines in this NGBW domain. And on the top is the MIRBs, which are, go, which are getting placed on the GRBMs. Uh, they are actually ICBMs with over 15,000 kilometers of range. And we have a long list of it and the list is growing. Then we have the anti-ballistic weapons. When, and we have two of them actually, one which do, does the mid-course uh, interception and the other which does a tactical or strategic interception. Then we got ASATs and we got ballistic weapons doing the ASAT thing. But the true game changer is actually the last one, the hypersonic weapons. And that's what we are going to be discussing in slightly greater details today. Three words define hypersonic weapons the best. Prompt, accurate, undefeated. These map the basic concept of hypersonic weapons. We just put all these three words together in a more tangible form and we can define these as ultra high speed, low detectability, high survivability, long range platforms capable of delivering conventional or nuclear uh, payloads. I take these three critical words, ultra high speed, specifically refers to hypersonic velocities, low detectabilities. We're talking about very, very depressed trajectories that stay well below the high level radars. And we're talking about high survivabilities. We're talking about missiles that can make very high speed maneuvers even at hypersonic speeds and that too at very high altitudes. Okay, the concept of these hypersonic weapons has practically been materialized into two separate configurations. The hypersonic rocket assisted boost and glide systems or the BGMs and the hypersonic rocket assisted cruise visit configuration or the HCVs. These two configurations are very different from each other as we can see also in the picture. We have taken the example of the DF-17, which is a BGV weapon, which has recently been fielded by China. It's a high-powered rocket. It has a high-powered rocket booster to launch the system, and to it is strapped an extremely maneuverable glide vehicle, as we can see in the front. On the right is a conceptual figure of possibly the French VMAX program, and as we can see, it is visibly different because it uses a scramjet engine to accelerate the missile inside the Earth's atmosphere. At present, as we can see, the configuration is such that both weapons are being carried on top of ballistic weapons, ballistic boosters actually. Whether they are being launched from ground or in the air, they will be using the, boost, the initial boosters which, will be, which are practically ballistics. But when compared with their traditional ballistic vehicles, they have some very, very characteristic standout features. And their main set of features are a very high degree of maneuverability. So they can change, continue to change course when they are getting detected. They have a very novel trajectory which stays well below the, uh, the azimuth of the radar. And they can complicate the, this, this, these two things put together will complicate the detection process for any of the ballistic missile defense systems. This makes these weapons unpredictable. The entire flight path cannot be predicted, it cannot be calculated like the, uh, like the ICBMs or the IRBMs. And so, it becomes very difficult to predict where will be the intended target. The territory lands on, the, on top of the target. So, these uh, features uh, are actually the standard features that make the hypersonic weapon so different from all others. And these features are there in the BGVs and they are there also in the HCVs. Now, the weapon characteristics that we've just discussed, I just put them together in a, a, in a hypothetical uh, mission profile, as we can see here. There are two weapons here, both are getting launched by the, hyper, uh, by the ballistic boosters. And the boost cloud, uh, we take the first case of the boost light weapon. It will reach the edge of the atmosphere, the, the BGVs. It will reach the edge of the atmosphere and then re-enter on gravity assist maneuver, accelerate under that gravity to reach hypersonic speeds. And well before the radar detection, it will be in hypersonic, complete hypersonic mode. At this point, it will leave the adversary practically no room to put up a formidable response. The hypersonic cruise vehicle tends to separate slightly earlier between 60, 30 or 80 kilometers of altitude. And the separation will then, it's going to start accelerating on scramjet engines. And those scramjet engines will keep on maneuvering the vehicle 
making the flight path unpredictable even if the radar is able to detect that. And then they enter the terminal phase with equal lethality and of course unpredictability. Now to build these hypersonic weapons, the concept is very simple. I, I took this picture from one of my own lectures. To build the hypersonic weapons, the idea is to take the booster stage of any uh, available ICBM or IRBMs and we remove the warhead stage and we replace that warhead stage with a hypersonic vehicle and we integrate this vehicle to the to the, strap, to the, to the basic booster, the, the, the zero stage. And then we place the warhead inside the hypersonic vehicle, the, the nose compartment. And then it's going to be launched on what is called as a double impulse trajectory. So the blue, the black part indicates the launch phase where the burnout will throw away the booster phase, the booster part, which is the red portion, and only the hypersonic vehicle will enter the blue portion of the of the trajectory, this portion, and from this re-entry point is going to make a re-entry uh, down to the target, uh, which is actually predefined and prefed into the system. Now, what we have seen here is uh, briefly the technological aspects of the hypersonic weapons. The next question was, who are the major players? We will define the three levels on, base, on the basis of the technology. At the core lies the technology leaders, which now includes China and Russia, that have developed and also fielded their hypersonic weapons. The US, another technology leader, is still a few years from developing and then deploying the hypersonic systems in national defense. The second layer consists of India, Japan, France and Germany and these are actually those countries that have already made considerable advancements and will be able to demonstrate their hypersonic weapons technology in a few years time. And finally we have a group of countries which have already conducted foundational level research on hypersonic weapons and they are now underway and the work is actually underway in a very sustained manner and this can be seen from the, the publications and the patents that are coming out on from these, these countries. Okay, so if you put this together, let's look at the inventory of the in-service hypersonic weapons that are presently fielded both by Russia and China. Russia has fielded three, three classes of weapons and China too. The avant-garde of course is the MIRB and has the hypersonic boost guard system. Then we have the hypersonic cruise missile Zircon, which is the only HCV at the moment fielded in the world. And China's DF-17 is, is based on an IRBM. And the WU-14 I have highlighted is possibly the orbital HCV that just completed the mission in this July. And may in time see it's uh, getting into the service. Additionally, we, there's also an array of upcoming hypersonic programs and as we can see as we discussed also we have five programs in US systems which are actually underway and ARRW is probably one of the programs which is really making big time headways. Um, on, the, on, on the China side we have the DF-41 with the DF-ZF integration which is almost in the advanced stages and uh, India's BrahMos 2 is a worthwhile program because that program has actually reached a very uh, 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 advanced level of completion. Okay, given the possibility of a tilt in strategic balance in favor of China and Russia, the US Department of Defense has recently accepted requests for additional funding to accelerate the development of hypersonic weapons for the conventional prompt and global strike program. For weapons that are envisaged to attack priority targets, with improved accuracy and they should remain undefeated by adversaries missile defense systems. Additionally, to counter the already fielded hypersonic weapons, there is research likely to get funded uh, into developing the counter hypersonic weapons technology so that the, new, the, the, the threat posed already by the fielded weapons can be neutralized both for the BGMs as well as the HCVs. We take a look now at the concept of operations or deployment of hypersonic vehicles and I'm create this concept CONOPS now. Okay, so the CONOPS starts on, we have two primary CONOPS. The CONOPS one is when we have uh, the surface launched hypersonic weapons 
and the Konops II is an air-launched hypersonic weapon aboard a strategic bomber. The operation takes place in, should take place actually, in three phases. The pre-strike phase will involve de detection, it will identify, map and localize the position and the timing of the target using the optical and navigational data from satellites which will be fused with air surveillance data. This will make it very, very accurate. In the launch phase, it, it will commence with the first with the uploading of the target data to the weapons and then subsequent launch atop the ICBM or a strategic booster. Stage separation will take place and it will dart the hypersonic vehicle into the space domain. And a mid-course correction will be applied to make the target very, very precise. The gravity assist re-entry initiates the strike phase and the hypersonic engine then takes over and the end course corrections are applied to refine the alignment with the target. The vehicle performs, performs evasive maneuvers where required and they are doing it at hypersonic speeds before impacting a pre-designated moving or stationary target both. In the current scenario, if you look at this picture, the, at a global level, the Konops can be applied in two possible major theatres, the Pacific and the North Atlantic Western European regions. But given the vastly strategic advantage offered by Pacific Ocean, we take a look at a hypersonic operations scenario in the Pacific Ocean. To create this scenario, we consider, let's say, two belligerents, one to the east, shown in the red, the other to the west, shown in blue. For the east side, the launch will be in the eastern direction, further into the eastern direction, towards the western adversary. Since the east side enjoys the advantage of the Earth's rotation, this advantage, the Earth's rotation, therefore, the hypersonic weapon will be launched into what is called as a posigrate orbit. And the posigrate orbit implies that this weapon will require smaller engines. It's a very, very big advantage. It's a smaller rocket booster. It can also follow what is called as a depressed trajectory, making it very difficult for the enemy radars to detect. So it will have a very low detectability. But this target will be moving away as this hypersonic vehicle is flying, so it will have the disadvantage of a longer time of flight towards the target, giving more response time to the adversary. Okay. Now, on the other hand, we take the case of the Western adversary, which will be launching towards the east side. And this launch will be further west, from, the, from their perspective, it will be a launch further westward. So this launch to the west would mean that they are launching into the rotation of Earth. So this, they are going to go into the rotation of Earth. This would be a retrograde launch. And retrograde launches mean bigger engines. And that's a big limiting factor. And possibly, they will also have to get assisted by air launches if they want to size the engines. Moreover, to accrue maximum advantage of the Earth's rotation, the hypersonic weapon will have to be launched on a lofted trajectory. So we're going to go really, really high, or possibly as high as about 800 kilometers into the orbit. And this will give them the advantage that the target will move closer to them, but it will ex possibly expose them to the radar detectability, thereby giving the, the enemy the advantage of a shorter time of flight, but exposing them to possible detectability. These two varying Konops mission profiles point towards one very important ability of hypersonic weapons. They can survive and strike under varying trajectories. It is, however, obvious that in a scenario of this kind, the adversary to the east tends to leverage greater advantage as compared to the one on the west side. In the same context, we can take a look at the South Asian theater, where the nuclear armed neighbors have been maintaining a strategic balance up till now, and despite all the border regions. Right, so, but three, three technologies are going to make a big impact in this region. The first is the BrahMos 2, which is the hypersonic BGM program, the ICBM Agni, MIRV program, and the STGV program that are going to make a, this, this 
area going to a new kind of a arms race. For this limited regional scenario, my team of researchers has mathematically modeled a possible mission scenario for this place. And this mission has been carried out on multiple trajectories of the available weapons and they have extracted a possible trajectory which can be seen in the green color on the mathematical side and then converted into the yellow trajectory which shows the boost phase, the stage separation, hypersonic light, unpowered design and terminal maneuvers. The important thing is this trajectory is going to be less than about 500 nautical miles and will require the weapon to range only 30 kilometers as opposed to going 110 or 120 kilometers that is usually the case in other weapons scenarios. For this, uh, what we see here, the scenario is one, as one we can imagine is very destabilizing in itself. For a region which has already been declared a nuclear flashpoint for the nuclear crisis group, Pakistan must therefore use all its possible efforts, both diplomatic and political channels, to pressurize India in preventing the uh, acquisition of the hypersonic weapons technology, of course this is coming to Russian support. Now either bilaterally or multilateral, the strategic restraint regime may also have to be redefined and this time it should also include specific restraints on hypersonic weapons including the MIRVs and ICBMs. Before I conclude, I'm going to make a final assessment of the strategic stability issues at the global scale. As one can see, the hypersonic weapons have the potential to shift the stability paradigm to a new equilibrium point, leading to possibly an unabated arms race. From the US perspective, they would like to have China part of the New START Treaty. However, from China's perspective, it is more important to stay well below the START threshold and stay out of the treaty. Even as US and Russia have agreed an entry into a five-year extension of this new treaty, this, this, pro this problem will, is continuing. My, my thoughts on this is that, and, and, I, I, and I've seen this thing also with other uh, think tanks, that there's a strong belief that BCC may either have to be replaced or maybe in addition to BCC, which is the bilateral consultative commission, we need to have a multilateral consultative commission which comprises all the global powers that are involved in ballistic technologies and use them to make a new and comprehensive START treaty that encompasses all the nations. This would have a ballistic weapon that has a new threshold. The previous one starts at over 1000. This should have as low as even less than 300 warheads. It should include platforms which are even less than 25% ballistics because the previous one addresses only those which are mainly ballistics or 50% or more ballistics. It should include weapons that can both fly on simultaneously on aerodynamic trajectories as well as on the ballistic trajectories. The previous start or the new start trajectory treaty addresses both separately and here we have weapons we are, which are doing the two things together in one package. So, and the last thing is, it should include all major regional powers that should become part of the STAR program. Thank you very much.